Thank you very much for attending. I know that very many of you are planning this journeys away from Johannesburg to places that might be a bit more interesting. But before that begins, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to you today Yasmin Sukha, uh, who is arguably one of South Africa's exports at the moment, if I might call it that way, uh, in the discussions about issues of accountability, both internationally and locally also, because I think the topic today to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission address the legacy of apartheid, or is there still an unfinished business, is as relevant today as when you first wrote the chapter for the Commission for, no, the Committee for, I guess, uh, CCSER, the NGO, in which you were reporting five years after the Commission had finished its work. Um, and essentially you said at that point, no, not quite. But before we actually introduce the topic, let me introduce Yasmin Sukha to you. She is currently the director of the Foundation for Human Rights in South Africa. But I think she really cut her teeth as an activist lawyer. Something that's not spoken about too much these days, because she has this international prominence. Uh, in the days of apartheid, there were lawyers like Yasmin who took on cases that were hopeless in many ways. That, um, sure that we make recommendations to deal with the guarantee of non-repetition. And this of course meant that you hi had to highlight the root causes of the conflict and of course the institutions involved. Again, um, you can see from the cartoons of Sapiro, um, the former Minister of Justice in the one, um, the fact that if you don't look into your past, you actually do to repeat that. And of course, despite the generous amnesty deal, um, as we're going to find out, um, the truth, um, I think, was something that was quite significantly lower than we expected from the amnesty process. Um, just to, you know, one of the things we say about any kind of transitional justice mechanism, that if you want it to work, you need three ingredients. Political will on the part of the new state, national ownership, and of course, an environment in which one enjoys security. Because people can't speak if they fear for their lives when they speak out. And this is certainly an issue that is being looked at in the Arab, the North African states, because in countries like Libya and countries like Egypt, while they are considering setting up truth and reconciliation commissions, there is a real concern about whether or not people can do that safely. And so um, it's a very important part of the ingredient. And of course when you begin these processes, it is not just about the outcome. The way in which you engage the democratic process is really important for building democracy and respect for the process. Um, and of course, I won't go into that slide. Again, just some indicators on which the success of the Commission will be judged. And really, as I always say in many countries, it is about at the end of the process, do citizens feel that they can trust their governments? Do they feel that their dignity has been restored? And do they believe that the institutions of the state will work for them irrespective of who they are, their race, their sexual orientation, their gender, their ethnicity. And of course in South Africa we have to ask the question, if we can still have an incident like Marikani happening, uh, what does that mean for the foundational premise that we have built in South Africa? The Truth Commission of course completed its work the first part of its work in 1998 and it handed over its report to the government. But it was not without controversy. In the final week before we were going to hand the report over, former President de Klerk decided that he was going to take the Truth Commission to court to stop the publication of the report unless they removed his name from the findings that were being made. And at that point, the Commission was advised by its legal counsel 
that they should postpone the battle so that they could fight the battle out for another day. And so symbolically, the commission blacked out the finding against his name. Little did it know that two days later, on the eve of the publication of the report, that the African National Congress would take it to court as well. Um, as all of us were traveling to Pretoria for the handing over the report, um, the ANC served papers on the Truth Commission to stop the publication of the report. And so the next morning, when the reporters were going to be sequestered with the report, in fact, the matter was being heard in the Cape Town High Court at the time. And the question that many reporters were asking South Africa is, what is in the report that both the Clare and the African National Congress don't want South Africans to know about? And of course, in the report, what we had intended to say was that, in fact, President de Klerk, from the, you know, from the time he had taken over, he had been a key member of cabinet, he had been a member of the State Security Council, and in fact, he had knowledge of the fact that after 1980, the South African state had become a criminal state, they had begun to establish death squads, and they targeted anybody that they perceived to be an opponent of the state. And that the war against the liberation movements was not about fighting communism, but in fact was about preserving the privilege of a few, the white minority. In the case of the liberation movements and the African National Congress, we acknowledge that the war that they had been conducted was a just war. But we indicated in our report that the means that they had engaged in at some point had in fact violated the Geneva Conventions and that they too had committed, in some instances, crimes against humanity. And quite frankly, we did not say anything that the African National Congress did not say themselves to us. But the ANC believed that in fact the Truth Commission had criminalized the struggle. Which is why when the Amnesty Committee completed its work and we handed over our final set of reports in 2003, there is a special chapter that we wrote in the book on command responsibility and of course the distinction between a just war and the means that are used to prosecute that war. Now of course in the years since then, if you look at the war on terror, in many ways this has really complicated um, the whole field of international humanitarian law. And in fact, the way in which I think the war on terror has created new problems, I think this really creates challenges for those who are working in conflict areas. And you see that in Syria today, as you have four different wars being fought out in Syria today. Um, and, and I think there's a really big question on how you bring an end to that. Um, I was talking to Vinod before, um, you know, um, we started the lecture, and I was saying to him that we, could, we should never underestimate how for ordinary people it is important to see those who are at the head of government held accountable. And I remember traveling to George when former President C.W. Buerta was in fact indicted and brought before black magistrate in the small town of George. And people were not worried about what he was going to say. But people traveled from all over the country just to come and see the sight of this man who would be responsible for terror and oppression, having to face a black magistrate and having to answer, in fact, for what he had done. At the end of the day, P.W. Werther refused to, in fact, collaborate with the commission. And the commission asked the attorney general at the time to charge him with crime in Europe. But for many people, in the end, the verdict or the judgment didn't matter. But it was merely having to look at him there and see him having to be held accountable. That brought the message home that today you can be powerful and in fact you can conduct criminal activities. But tomorrow you may have to answer. And this is certainly true if you look at the Arab Spring, as you see the trial of Hosni Mubarak, 
the fact that Saif al Islam is sitting in a jail in Zantan, and of course the, um, the expedition of Ben Ali is being sought by the Tunisians. But of course, in South Africa, in terms of did we deal with all of the issues that we should have? And one of the critiques of the South African Commission, and one that was fought out bitterly within the Commission, was this question of socio-economic rights and in fact the structural causes of violence. If you look at the mandate of the Truth Commission, to a large extent, in fact, it was influenced by the Latin American experience of you know, military dictatorships transitioning to civilian rule. And so in Latin America, there was an extraordinary focus on civil and political violations. So torture, extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances were really the order of the day. And in South Africa, that of course was the main mandate the Commission had to look at. But in South Africa, some of us argue, and in fact, Professor Nibel Alexander, who just died um, in this week, he made representations to the Commission that if the Commission really wanted to understand this question of structural violence, it should look at the structural impact of the policies of apartheid. What did land dispossession mean? What did it mean when people were removed to the black spots and in fact to the former homelands? What did it mean when the government invested so poorly in black education? What did job reservation mean for South Africa? And in my view, if the Commission had focused on those issues, we would have had a better sense of reparation. We would have looked at the collective question that the beneficiaries of apartheid have to answer today. In fact, what we did was we individualized these crimes. And in fact, we arrived at what, in my view, is a partial truth. We looked at the trigger pullers. We looked at the torturers. But we didn't look at the systemic policies of apartheid. And this is what warns South Africa today. If you look at the documents of the National Planning Commission, the diagnostic report, it actually sets out for the first time that four out of ten South Africans work. The other six don't have a job and they are unemployable. If you look at the statistics around black South Africans and those who pass the trick, if one million of them start school 12 years later, if 500,000 of them are left in the schooling system to write the trick, that's a lot. And if you actually take those figures and you look at how many black students make it to university, how many finish with a master's, 